Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm uh, delighted to introduce to you today Professor uh, Sid Loza Mendirata, who holds a, PT a PhD in architecture from the University of Coimbra. He is an integrated researcher in the Center uh, for Social uh, Studies at the University of Coimbra. And since 2012, he holds the chair in the history of Portuguese architecture in the Department of Architecture of Lusophona University in Porto. He specializes in the cultural heritage of the Portuguese influence in South Asia, and he has conducted uh, 27 geo-reference topographical surveys of archaeological sites in India in collaboration with the Archaeological Survey of India. And he will be speaking to us about one of these sites today, the old city of Goa, shaping it and uh, the role which slaves or dependent labor also played in connection with this urban planning. Professor Mandirata Sid, welcome and thank you very much for speaking to us today. We are really looking forward to your presentation. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Professor Hegelwald, for um, Welcoming here, uh, me in Bonn, and for your uh, introduction. It's uh, a delight to be back with this weather. And uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Kepler for all his help at the uh, archive in the uh, APK. Uh, and I, as it will become obvious, my training is in architecture, so I'm not a historian. I think um, that, that will become clear as I move along. Um, but it's always a pleasure to talk about uh, old uh, Goa and Indo-Portuguese history. So I will be providing first a brief introduction uh, um, context for uh, old Goa or the city of Goa, and which was the capital of the Portuguese state of India, which uh, was the early modern um, uh, empire with a lot of uh, quotation marks, which the Portuguese established in the Indian Ocean region, in Eastern Africa, and in uh, Asia. This was uh, essentially uh, a maritime uh, endeavor. It was originally planned to control the maritime routes along the Indian Ocean, and especially to control the bottlenecks of the long distance uh, maritime routes. As you can see there, some of them still are bottlenecks today. Uh, and the plan was to, um, well, initially the plan was to bring pepper and spices from uh, South Asia to Portugal, but the Portuguese soon found out that it was more lucrative to actually control the regional trades within the Indian Ocean and between, uh, say, for example, Japan and China. Um, so uh, Goa, the city of Goa was uh, conquered in 1510 and became the central hub for all these uh, um, trade routes. Uh, of course, the Portuguese only uh, enjoyed um, this uh, maritime superiority for about one century, and then soon the Dutch and the British started uh, competing with much better uh, ships and, and, and crews. At the center, so at the center of this network was the city of Goa, which developed into one of the most important port cities of the Indian Ocean during the 16th century. It also became a center of Christian missionary activity, uh, where all where a lot of the religious orders had their mother houses and uh, very large and monumental convents and colleges. The Portuguese also built extensive fortifications in this uh, region. And so you see there the city of Goa with one of the most extensive, or rather the most extensive uh, fortification wall built by the Portuguese anywhere in the world with about 21 kilometers circling the city of Old Goa and a lot of rural territory. And then you see how the Portuguese tried to defend the, the entrance to the two rivers once the, the Dutch ships started trying to blockade uh, the city of Goa. So, the city of Goa is located in this island. There's a, a, a navigable channel, oh, sorry, just uh, on the eastern side of, the, of this island. And uh, it was one of the first places to be uh, where the Portuguese, for example, started converting the local uh, population to Christianity. 
around 1590s, the city of Olgoa reached its um, economic uh, and population um, peak, 1590-1600. And this is the depiction of Olgoa by the Dutch uh, secretary to the archbishop, uh, Lynch Houghton, who was also a spy. And he uh, depicts uh, a city with a lot of ships and, and, and um, a lot of houses, and it's actually a very interesting and detailed uh, image that we are going to see uh, again. And we have then the monumental churches, which were about 30 years ago or 40 years ago classified as World Heritage by uh, UNESCO. And these were both belonging to the secular and religious and um, uh, secular and the regular clergy. And uh, for example, there you see the Franciscan uh, Mother House, like the Holy Spirit, Church of the Holy Spirit. And you also see on the right hand side, the Sea Cathedral, which was actually the seat of the Archdiocese of Goa, which became, which was geographically the largest Archdiocese which ever uh, existed. And here you see two other examples, the Jesuit Church, and here, uh, there were also Italian missionaries coming directly from Italy to Old Rome and building churches and, and uh, with a very clear uh, Italian uh, influence, architectural influence. And uh, of course, Old Goa was the center of what generally became termed as Indo-Portuguese art, um, an umbrella term which can include a lot of regions. And uh, it was uh, the religious orders, especially uh, patronized a lot of uh, commission from local um, art, uh, artists. So there are basically uh, these phases in the urban history of Goa, and, and today I'll be focusing on the phase of decline and abandonment. So after 1590 or after 1600, when the city starts to decline. So although my presentation is called Shaping Old Goa, maybe it would be more correct to think about unshaping Old Goa or undoing Old Goa, because in fact, what happened to the city was it was that it was uh, abandoned, ruined, and dismantled, and its building materials were taken elsewhere to build other buildings and to build also a new capital on the other side of the island. So we have about two and a half centuries of decline, and then finally the city is abandoned and becomes uh, submerged beneath these palm trees. The reasons are interesting um, for this decline, and it was a kind of a deadly cocktail of epidemics, recurring epidemics, the Dutch and then English a competition in the Indian Ocean, and also the Maratha Empire's um, military expansion. So the city was, these were the main factors which led to the city becoming, uh, losing population, losing commercial activity. And of course, it was a city which had developed from the port activity from services. And so once those services and those commercial activities start to shrink, the city also um, is very much affected by that. The main reason why the whole city did not disappear was because of St. Francis Xavier's body, which uh, is kept in the, one of the churches of, of the city. And it still is, although maybe not so much as it was before, but it is still is a popular devotion. There's a very strong devotion of Christians to the relics, to see the relics of uh, St. Francis Xavier. And every 10 years, as you may know, the body, the relics are taken down from his, his uh, resting place, which is high up in a, in a very high uh, kind of mausoleum, and it is taken in procession. So here we see a picture from the 1950s when the Portuguese were very, the Portuguese uh, dictatorship was clinging on to go and trying to exploit this devotion and trying to save not only the, city, the, the buildings of the city, but the actual colonial territory itself. It is essential to understand that Old Goa and Goa's population was very much divided in 
we can say five main groups and these groups didn't get along usually with each other so um, the Portuguese especially in this eastern sphere of their empire they were uh, not very disciplined or they were not very uh, fond of getting along with each other and these groups specifically were very uh, always trying to control and, and trying to you know be in, in, in control and trying to grab power from from each other so the first group of, is the what we would call Reinois, and these are Portuguese who are born in Portugal and who only serve for a few years, eight, 10, 12 years in the in, in Goa or in or in or in Asia. These were the highest positions in, in all the spheres of the military, the justice, the religious uh, orders, and here you see a viceroy. Uh, these were the Reinois. And then we had the Portuguese born in Asia, in Goa. These were called the descendants or also the filhos uh, India or casados, married men. Uh, they were called married men because when the Portuguese conquered the city, the, the viceroy at the time encouraged his soldiers to marry about 3,000 Muslim widows who had been, whose husbands had died during the, the battle. Uh, and these groups of descendants, they obviously had inter uh, their their backgrounds were mixed more and more um and uh, they were very powerful especially in, in the army in the military and then they didn't get along especially with this group which were the christians of course so the local population converted by the portuguese who it's very important to remember kept their caste consciousness. So you had Brahmin Christians, you had Kshatriya Christians, you had um, Dalit Christians, and uh, very much divided along caste lines. And the caste consciousness was was very important for for the identity of this uh, group. And so this group became more and more powerful as time progressed, and they became also really the majority. Then we have non-Christians, overwhelmingly Hindus. Um, there was always a Christian, uh, non-Christian Hindu population in Mount Goa. Uh, today, there's a bit a sense that the Portuguese didn't tolerate uh, Hindu inhabitants in Mount Goa or, or in their capital city, or, or that they were not allowed to live there, that could only work there. But uh, actually, the documents, the evidence shows that they were very much in charge of all the commercial, uh, the shops and the commercial activity within the city um, was very much always in the hands of Hindu merchants. And then we have the slaves and the freed, freedmen, free slaves. The history of Olgoa in general is very much under-researched. Um, and especially groups which don't have a lot of voice in, in the documents. And among them, of course, the slave population is very much, uh, it's a challenge for to, to understand how, um, how they contributed, how they shaped, how they took part in, in the day-to-day -day life of the city. Um, it's also a challenge because the legal status of slavery is, is was not very clear in, in South Asia, uh, and the Portuguese themselves started to try to, cla to classify and, and, and um, establish how slaves could be legally uh, acquired uh, by the Portuguese, because uh, although the institution or the the broad, uh, no, no, I'm starting to, I don't have the right words, but uh, although the, the practice of slavery was was very, um, had been there in South Asia between Africa and, and South Asia for a long time, uh, it was not, I think, legally um, framed, as far as I know, at least. For the Portuguese, definitely it was not until a bit later. So, um, the Portuguese uh, 
brought slaves from five main regions, Eastern Africa, mostly from the Mozambique region, uh, from the Bengal, the Bay of Bengal and, and the Bengal region, from the broad area of the Eastern Indonesian archipelago and from China and Japan. Uh, so of the slaves of African heritage, they were uh, usually termed as kafsh, of course, from the word kafirs. Um, while the other slaves, especially Chinese and Japanese, it was very common that they would become free after serving for a fixed number of years, so say 15, 20 years, then it was normal that they would be uh, free. And um, they, of, they were different um, uh, positions or different uh, occupations for, for um, these slaves, for example, um, from Bengal, Portuguese raiders would would, uh, would attack the villages and the regions along the coast, and they would enslave the population specifically to man the boats, uh, rowing boats, which were a very very uh, difficult uh, and and uh, well tragic. Uh, to, uh, place to be because uh, they would last normally the slaves or the people who would be enslaved would not last for more than two or three years in these uh, rowing boats. And so I think still today in, in Bengal and Bangladesh and in, in West Bengal, there is this memory, very strong memory of Portuguese raids just uh, getting people to, to, these these were Portuguese people operating outside the legal official uh, administration. These were uh, adventurers and, and pirates, etc. It is very difficult to estimate the slave population of the city of Goa until the 1720 uh, census. And I say census here also with quotation marks because it's not the census in the normal uh, word. Uh, in 1720, the city was already a fraction of what it had been, um, maybe one tenth of what it had been, uh, one eighth. Uh, so we then have to work backwards with esti estimates. And a rough estimate for 1635, for example, returns the slaves at about 12,750 or about 44% uh, of the population. I believe that at the peak of the city's population economic uh, period, slaves would have been at least half the population, if not more. Like in Brazil, we know for the 18th century in cities in Brazil and regions, the whole region of Maranhão, for example, slaves were, I think the slave population was close to three quarters of the, um, of the population, at least in, in Maranhão, we had that idea. So I believe that um, this was maybe the peak population of over 70,000, 70, 80,000, and that at this time, slaves would have been at least half of the population. Um, and as I said, around the middle of the 16th century, the Portuguese were trying to establish how slaves could be legally brought enslaved. And so there were these five uh, ways of uh, enslaving uh, people, but this, this, these were not, these were determinations by the archdiocese. So it was the religious, the archbishop and the religious orders were concerned, of course, about the, the legal and, and the Christian aspects, the theological uh, aspects of, of slave ownership. They themselves, of course, owned a lot of slaves. Um, this uh, census, is interesting, the 1720 uh, census is interesting because it's giving the population of the city according to the parishes. So Old Goa had eight parishes and we know uh, where they were. And so if we uh, translate uh, the 1720 census into the, the parishes, we have an approximate view of, of how the population was divided between these three groups. So, uh, slaves, Christians, and non-Christians. Nominally, the slaves were Christians, but they were, of course, uh, divided. And, and, uh, and so here we see that 
1720, when the city was already very much declining, decline and half abandoned, we, although we don't know the exact limits of each parish in street by street, we can see more or less the, 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 the proportion. For example, in the, the northeastern parish of Santa Luzia, we see a very high uh, Hindu uh, proportion. And uh, in the central parishes of Sea Cathedral and uh, the Rosary, Our Lady of the Rosary, we see a very high slave proportion. Um, whilst in some other parishes, like in the, in the Santissima Trindad, in the southeast, there were no slaves at all and very few people in general. That was the area most affected by the epidemic. Santa Luzia was uh, a place where there was shipbuilding activity for uh, actually boats uh, were built for, for river traffic and for uh, uh, local regional uh, um, traveling uh, so vessels of very small small size. And it's apparent that these were built, these majority of the population were Hindu and so they, the carpenters also were probably of uh, Hindu. Uh, background. Whilst in the other side of the city, we have the suburb of uh, São Pedro Panlin, where most of the richer, more affluent families of Old Goa, of the city of Goa, fled or shifted. They, they started shifting towards the west uh, along the kind of a linear uh, city which uh, or suburban area which developed along the western side. So these two um, this, this census allows us to compare um, this, um, have, have a broad idea of this, of the, the division of the population. Regarding the slave population um, in the central parishes, um, I believe it's connected to the religious orders and to maybe the, the main equipments, the main civic uh, infrastructure. So we had these huge convents and colleges. We had the Inquisition tribunal. We had the uh, Archdiocese uh, Palace. We had uh, the Senate. So then we had the Royal Hospital, which was quite big also for the time. So these were the institutions, I believe, that were actually having the largest number of slaves. And uh, these were uh, uh, religious, most of them religious uh, institutions. So the first point I would make is that one of the reasons why these colleges, these convents, these churches were the last buildings to resist the depopulation process of Old Goa and were able to keep functioning even when all the city, almost all the city's inhabitants had fled or had died or had gone elsewhere, was because they had access to this uh, slave workforce. This becomes especially true after the loss of the northern province, which was the main uh, economic, one of the main economic uh, uh, providers for the city of Goa and for the territory of Goa after the Portuguese had lost control of the Indian Ocean. So uh, once the British and the Dutch from started to control the main, the main uh, uh, maritime trade routes, the Portuguese became more and more dependent on little territorial possessions like in Mozambique, the Northern Province, or even Sri Lanka for a while. And the Northern Province was exporting uh, mainly rice and wood, and these were essential for, for uh, Old Goa. And a lot of the religious orders had owned a lot of land, even actually villages in the Northern province. So in, 15, uh, in 1740, uh, most of the religious orders in Goa lose that, uh, those villages, those properties. And I believe that they managed to function most of them until 1835 because they, were, uh, they had this slave uh, workforce. Another interesting aspect about the slave, well, not interesting, but uh, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, the city didn't have a proper water uh, system, didn't have almost any, it didn't have any aqueducts, it, didn't, it only had two fountains of drinking water for a city which 
70,000 people, if you can imagine. Uh, most of the people drank water from wells, those who could not afford water being brought from these two fountains. And the water was brought from the fountains, obviously, by the slaves. So there were uh, hundreds and hundreds of wells, and most people drank water from the wells, and then they got sick with cholera, and that's how most of the people actually died uh, to recurrent uh, cholera epidemics, um, obviously, uh, which couldn't, people didn't know if, if it, what it was, if it was through the air, if it was through the water, uh, so there was no way of controlling it. Uh, but those who could afford the water brought, uh, especially from the fountain in the, towards the west in Bangining, which was the one furthest away. The Jesuits, I think, kind of, I, I think they built a pipe system uh, to their main uh, house, but they were the only ones. Everyone else was dependent on the slaves getting water from the wells and selling water. So... This is another aspect that the slaves were expected to earn money for their owners by selling everything which they could, especially water. Of course, their uh, other description, especially by travelers of slave owners, forcing female slaves into prostitution, etc. So uh, another kind of consequence, I think, about this dependency on the slave workforce is that Portuguese never bothered to build a proper water system like they did in other places with aqueducts or more fountains, etc. And of course, the color endemics. Um, the Portuguese never uh, put together a slave army like other uh, sultan, like other especially Islamic powers in South Asia had done. So there was a long-standing tradition of slave warriors coming from the region, probably speaking from Ethiopia, and um, being integrated into um, armies, large armies, standing armies in, in several of the sultanates or even um, in Persia, I think, and in, in at a certain point in the Mughal Empire. Um, so the Portuguese never uh, did this. Uh, they did, of course, use a lot of slaves for their battles, uh, but they fought in small groups with their owners. So um, as Timothy Walker notes, the slaves that the Portuguese um, Eastern Empire employed sporadically as soldiers were levied in small uh, numbers from the households of Portuguese elites and often fought side by side with their masters. So, kind of quote. so this greatly reduced the risk of a, of a revolt, of, a, of an uprising, um, which the Portuguese obviously they wouldn't be able to control. But in other uh, sultanates, in other powers of India, the, the slave warriors of Ethiopian heritage, the Habshis or the cities, they became, uh, was very powerful at a certain point in, in, in different times, in different places in, in South India. And then there is the issue of runaway slaves, which was always um, uh, happening since the beginning with the Portuguese uh, bringing uh, slaves, especially slaves of African heritage. Um, usually when these slaves ran away, they would join pre-existing uh, communities of, of, of cities. And there's an interesting study of, uh, by um, Stephanie Hassel, which shows that about 70% uh, of the inquisition processes relating to slaves were connected to their conversion to Islam. So these were probably runaway slaves who had been fetched back or who had returned or who had uh, in somehow converted or had been amongst uh, Muslims, most probably amongst uh, city communities. Once the British controlled uh, in the early 19th century, established their supremacy all over South Asia and along the borders of Goa, of course, then the slaves could, at the moment they would leave the Goan territory, they would be free. And this is what happened, I believe, in around the 1840s, 1850s. So almost like 
I think approximately at that time, they would have been, um, I think, a thousand slaves or something like that. And uh, they disappear from, from the history of, of Goa and, and uh, they become memories in, in the family, uh, the rich families. So um, this is uh, another aspect, but the treaties which the Portuguese made before that during the early modern period with all the, the neighboring powers, usually each treaty had always one article about returning slaves or being compensated for runaway slaves. That was very, very common. Charles is my um, second point, uh, talking about religious segregation in the city of uh, Old Goa. The word is more commonly known by its anglicized version of Cho, uh, associated with the city of Mumbai, uh, probably originating from either a Marathi or a Sanskrit word, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's there in Portuguese documents from the early 16th century onwards. So um, Sanskrit, I think, is a bit more probable. So Shaos uh, are, um, they are, they, they are present in many documents, but one has to connect them to uh, descriptions, for example, of travelers who also mentioned that the city of Oldo was very much segregated and separated along uh, between Christians and non-Christians. So, for example, uh, the Italian traveler, Gamelli Carreri, in the late uh, uh, 17th century, mentions that um, Hindus and, and Muslims lived in a separate quarter of the town. Earlier documents, Portuguese documents, mention Charles as inhabited mostly by Hindus, but also mixed between Hindus and Christians. And there is there are quite a few documents, official documents, uh, trying to say, to separate that the, the shawls should be only either for one or for the other. So this is a constant um, issue for, especially for the religious orders and for the archdiocese that they don't want to see Christians and non-Christians living together in the same shawl or in the same house or in the same, even sometimes in the same street. And the reasons for these, for this uh, concern, I think is fairly obvious, is because most of the recent converts to Christianity, they were not very steady in their uh, conversions. So uh, uh, they were fragile conversions and they had to be protected from the influence of their, maybe their relatives who didn't convert or uh, uh, people they knew who didn't convert. So in the Portuguese uh, dictionary, the first Portuguese dictionary of the early uh, 18th century, uh, Shao is described as a palm grove wherein there are uh, laborers living as in uh, a village. So laborers to di distinguish them from people uh, working in agriculture. So not uh, uh, people working on the, of the land, but people uh, having particular uh, activities connected to manufacture and so on. Charles Boxer connected the shawls to the bailadeiras uh, or the notch girls, notch women who, uh, dancers rather, who um, then later on during the British times 19th, 20th century, we had this reputation connecting them to prostitution and so ever. But um, the Portuguese word by the way, um, also entered French and other languages. And Boxer uh, notes that there are a lot of official documents which say, trying to forbid by the way, these women which initially might have been connected to Hindu temples serving women associated to a temple, working for a temple, um, forbidding them from entering the shawls and uh, saying that they were the source of almost all evil which was affecting the city with these women because the Portuguese were uh, giving them all their money and giving them uh, giving their relatives weapons and, and uh, it was it was putting the, the security in risk. So 
uh, Charles Boxer uh, in 1961, so makes this uh, connection between the shawls and the bailadeiros. It becomes clear that the Portuguese tolerated Hinduism, certain practices of Hinduism within these shawls. Another concern is that the city council at one point says that we should bring the shawls should not be allowed to have high walls because we cannot see what's going on inside. Because the, the concern was that Hindu weddings, Hindu practices, religious practices, and of course, the notch dances were going on uh, within these uh, shawls. The challenge here is to locate them. Where were these uh, shawls? We, there is this idea that they were mostly everywhere, except in the very center, the old pre-Portuguese center of the city. But if we look at the drawings by uh, Ms. Schotten or even by other views of Olgoa, one doesn't really get the idea of where, uh, because these shawls, the habitations were of uh, ephemeral nature. So they were not made out of stone or they didn't have whitewash, they didn't have wood tiles. They were probably using other materials. And this is not depicted in, in these drawings. So if we look again at the 1720 census, and if we start to look at some of the early 20th century records, which are uh, giving the names of the different plots within the, the area, which once was occupied by the city. Uh, for about 173 plots, the name Shaw comes up, I think around 10 or 11 times. And if we see the distribution of the population in 1720, there is this feeling that the Hindu population is mostly outside the central core of the city and more towards the eastern area. So, so it grows towards the eastern suburbs and the eastern area of the city. But I hope that soon we will be, through other research, other projects, we will be able to locate this in shawls within the city. For now, I propose that they were mostly concentrated on the eastern uh, part of, of uh, Old Goa and that they were walled off. They were, the, the owners were usually Christians. So uh, most of excluding the community of people, Hindus who own shops in certain streets, most of the property was owned by Christians and these shawls were certainly owned. By, by Christians and uh, they were rented out to uh, communities of Hindus who normally live according to caste um, to their to their caste uh, lives. So this for example is a, is a later the 1950s uh, map which shows the plots of the city and through a kind of a regressive analysis I think we would be able to find where these uh, shawls were. As, um, as the Inquisition became stronger, as the Portuguese after the counter-reformation period, as, as the Portuguese became more uh, trying to enforce more conversion laws and Inquisition laws, the Bailadeiros were kind of expelled to two small islands on the eastern side of, of the island of Tishwadi, and, they, and there they were kind of tolerated in spite of the Archbishop not, uh, not liking it, they were tolerated there. It's interesting to note that one of these islands was property of the Jesuits. So they actually owned the whole island and, and they had feudal rights over the, the island's inhabitants. And there are, I don't know if it's anti-Jesuit propaganda or not, but there are, uh, from the time, there are rumors that the Jesuits were profiting from these uh, by the leaders from the Natch schools. So the Jesuits had a lot of diversity enterprises going on. Relating to caste, third point, how caste shaped the city of Goa. Here, I would like to talk about caste within the Christian community. So if you, the third group were the, were the Goans, the local people, the Goans who were converted to Christianity. And they became very, very powerful. Or they became rather a majority 
and they became more and more powerful. But the other Portuguese, both the Portuguese born Portuguese and the, and the Portuguese born in India, they were very much against this group of people rising and, and becoming uh, enfranchised. So they didn't allow them to enter the religious orders, for example. They could, they would train them as priests and they could become parish priests, but they were not allowed to rise beyond a certain level within the, the religious orders. They were not allowed to rise anywhere in the army. Um, they were very much uh, kept at the lower levels of, of religion and the army and, and uh, the civil service. But nonetheless, they became the elite of Golden Christian identity, especially the priests. So the Golden priests, the Golden clergy, which were not allowed to join the Jesuits or the Franciscans or the Theotines or the Augustinians or the Dominicans or the Carmelites, they created their own religious orders. So uh, two religious orders, one for Brahmins and one for Shepherds. And with these, uh, the issue here was that they created them outside the city first. So their, their base was outside the city. For this group, the city of Olgoa was, was a symbol of the power which was keeping them down. So it was very much the center of the two groups, the, the Portuguese groups, or the Portuguese population, which was stopping them from developing into a true uh, elite, a true, a true uh, a group. And so there, the creation of a Goan Christian identity, besides being very much uh, connected to this caste, caste issues, because of course the the Christian Brahmins and the Shatri Brahmins they didn't get to know. And the Brahmins of the first religious order didn't allow the Shatris to join their order, so the Shatris had to start their own order. Um, Shatris or, or Shardos, as they're known in, in, in Goa. So what happened was that um, this religious, this the Goan clergy, its power base was outside the city. It was in the villages and the small towns in the rest of the Golan territory, in the north, in Berdej, in Salsit, in the villages and in the numerous villages which, which made up the, the Golan territory, even in the island area around the city. And in 1759, um, the Jesuits were expelled and the Golan clergy took over all the parishes in South Sid, so in the which was the richest and the largest province uh, of Goa. And this is coincides it's simultaneous with the process of the creation of a Goan aristocracy, which has the power base in the villages. It lives off the land, uh, it, it's only allowed to flourish in the rural area. So at this point in the 18th century, the society is very much divided by a very small and becoming less and less powerful Portuguese descendant community and this majority of Goan Christians who are controlling the countryside, controlling the parishes in the countryside, and they are forming their identity. Uh, well, in the 18th century, it's already formed. You might have heard of the Pinto Revolt in 1787. And so they start to assert their identity. And in the countryside, in the rural areas, they build these huge churches, beautiful churches, which are now described as Goan churches. And these churches, previously known as Indo-Portuguese architecture, but now better known as Goan architecture, these churches are the, the assertion of this Goan identity. In rural Goa, of course, they might be looking at the city of Goa for the main models or the same uh, or for some of its influence, but they are creating its own image, the own image of the Goan church, of the Goan identity. And so when the Marquis de Pombal in the late 18th century said, no, well, now we have to rebuild the capital. And he starts to, uh, he, he, with his almost dictatorial power, say, now we have to rebuild the capital. And, and, uh, and um, he starts, he says, who, so the, the issue comes, who is going to fund this, this, these projects to rebuild Opal Goa? And 
the Marquis de Pombal say of the villages, of course, the one villages, they are the rich, they're the source of all wealth at, at the moment, uh, which was the economy had become a completely rural economy with a loss of trade. And the villages, they kind of resist this order. And they it totally becomes part of a, of a kind of a game where they're pretending to rebuild the city, but it's just a waste of money and waste of time. So the city is not rebuilt. It becomes abandoned. And in 1835, finally, the religious orders are extinct. And this was the moment that the Goan clergy was waiting for to take all the valuable religious artifacts, statues, uh, mm -hmm. organs, pulpits, um, images, this, this, all everything which had made these convents, these colleges, these churches so rich during the early modern period, and which had always denied the Golan clergy the, the possibility of even joining them, um, but which often had trained them as priests. So um, finally, these artifacts, they are spread all over Goa, the churches all over the territory of Goa. Uh, you have the bell, which now stands at the main church in Panjim, the present day capital coming from the Augustinian convent. And then you have all over Goa, you have these uh, wonderful altars and woodworks, which, which now uh, are in sometimes in small churches and you can see that these altars and woodworks were built for larger churches and they were just made to fit into other places. So there's a, there was a kind of a dispersion of objects uh, from, from the city of Old Goa. And of course, the city itself in 1835 closed down, the last inhabitants left. The only reason why the whole city uh, the inhabitants left and the city was pulled down and its materials were reused. The laterite stone was reused to build other buildings. And this, this is also an interesting point because um, laterite, it was, it was cheaper to actually quarry the ruins and the older buildings than to mine for fresh, for new laterite. So the laterite was, was rebuilt, was reused, and also the other stones, the basalt stones, which were very rare, um, and so the house by house, building by building, the city was dismantled and kind of rebuilt elsewhere. The only reason why the whole city didn't disappear was uh, St. Francis Xavier. So this was the real miracle of St. Francis Xavier was keeping <laughs> the, the buildings uh, there. Um, otherwise, I mean, it's, 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 in my opinion, it could have actually disappeared. Thank you.